edition of the Mindset Game Podcast, and I'm your host, James Roberts. I'm a two-time Paralympian, online training and nutrition coach, and owner of James Roberts Fitness. You can find more of my content by going to my website, fitamputee.co.uk. But before we get started with today's show, first off, let me take this opportunity to welcome back the regular listeners. And if this is your first time listening to the show, I hope you enjoy this episode and decide to subscribe to the show. And on today's show, I've got Dr. Robert Wheel. He specializes in pediatric medicine, orthotics, and sports medicine. He's written a column for the Napaville Sun and Aurora Beacon since 2007 as the sports doctor. His goal is to provide sports medicine information to athletes, their families, and coaches, and all readers. Additionally, he hosts a weekly radio show called The Sports Doctor on bbsradio.com. He addresses current topics in medicine and sports and often includes guest speakers who bring a wealth of knowledge from their various professional backgrounds. So welcome onto the show, Bob. Hey, the sports doctor's in, James. How can I help you? I'll throw in my last name, you know, in case somebody's listening, Dr. Bob Weil, W-E-I-L. Glad to be with you, James. Thanks for coming on. Uh, so before we delve into today's topic, Bob, can you divulge to my listeners how you came, came to be known as a sports doctor to start with? Okay. Uh, I'm a sports podiatrist, James, so I specialize in the role of the foot in sports, Uh, I subspecialize in prescription orthotics, whether I'm putting orthotics in somebody's skates or their skis or their grandmother's walking shoes. And uh, I've been doing radio, believe it or not, for over 30 years. And I had a local show on a very famous jazz blues station in Glen Ellen, Illinois, WDCB. And this is where we started with the sports doctor. And uh, I've, uh, the label has stayed with me, and I continue to um, uh, brag about it. <laughs> and, and for my listeners, I had the privilege of being on your show before you come on to mine, and I was very appreciative of that. So if you get a chance to listen to that episode or any of Dr. Bob's uh, uh, previous shows, I, I would very much uh, get you to do that if you, if you got the opportunity. So, so you, yes, you James, if, if, if people go to sportsdoctorradio.com, if they go to radio shows, they can go back almost 10 years. They could see who the guests are, what the topics are. And absolutely, James was a guest on the Sports Doctor a few weeks ago, and it's up on the site. So, yes, that was a great show. So, in terms of the orthotics now, Bob, why would athletes? come to it more specifically because with me having a disability i i know orthotics in terms of uh people needing calipers and whatnot to aid their walking but what what are kind of the benefits for an able-bodied person no the benefits are to put the foot ankle and lower extremity james in its best functional position and even again people with disabilities who are weight bearing and are challenged by balance, orthotics can be a real weapon to help enhance uh, uh, stability and balance. But in a, uh, uh, an athlete, whether it's a young boy or girl, uh, whether it's a serious athlete, whether we're talking about someone who's on the golf course, walking, jogging, uh, then orthotics job uh, is to properly position you know, the foot and ankle is a complicated mechanism, and the song, the foot bones connected to the ankle bones connected to the knee bone, is where it's at. The feet affect all areas above. So in many instances, we're looking to enhance uh, uh, efficiency, or we're looking sometimes commonly to redistribute weight away from a painful area. You know, foot problems, foot pain is very, very common. And orthotics might be used to redistribute weight uh, away from an area that's a problem or might be uh, at the high end. I put a lot of orthotics in figure skates. And like I mentioned to you, James, you're a, a Paralympian. But the 2010 
men's Olympic figure skating gold medalist, Evan Lysacek, grew up in the Chicago suburban area. And I put orthotics in Evan's skates when he was 10 years old. 14 years later, he was the best in the world. I'm still putting orthotics in 10-year-olds' skates. So proper alignment and balance is usually the generalization that we're talking about, James. And is that because of the, the nature of the skate itself is not conducive to, to balance now? Well, it's also, think about it. Some people have flat feet. Uh, others might have high arches. Somebody else might have bow legs. Somebody else might have knock knees. And all of those things are common imbalances in the human population. Once you go into skates where you're raising the center of gravity about an inch and a half and you're balancing on a blade, whether it's hockey or figure skating, that's about an eighth inch wide, then you're magnifying these kinds of imbalances. Uh, so uh, probably 75, 80% of the population, we could nitpick some type of functional imbalance one leg might be longer than the other. The pelvis might be out of alignment. So these are common imbalances that can be magnified if you're talking about an edging sport, like figure skating or skiing, for that matter. Well, why, why so skiing? Because it's, it's, the blade is, in essence, flat. But why would that be a problem out of interest? Be because you're talking about um, tremendous edging and turning, and the ability to be stable, uh, and the ability to be in the proper position uh, is something that's very, very important. And again, at the high level of skating or skiing, there's not an athlete out there who doesn't have some sort of orthotic, uh, ideally made individually uh, to be able to enhance the uh, uh, foot and uh, lower leg function and bob to some degree would the same imbalance happen in sports such as soccer uh, american football uh, of course but would that be to a lesser the, degree well it might not be as as uh, uh, as much of enhanced in performance but for the most part orthotics done properly that athlete's going to be a step or two quicker they're going to have better stability and balance, whatever the sport is. Uh, and, and I write about that in my book, hashtag, Hey Sports Parents, where we're really dealing with youth sports and the tremendous physical and mental pressure. But you're right, whether it's soccer, whether it's tennis, whether you're a runner, whether you're looking to play any other type of sport, being in the best shoe for you, besides orthotics also talking about the importance james of strengthening the feet and ankles that's the major triad or three-part area that we pay big attention to when we're, we're looking to do one of two things that everybody cares about james one how do i prevent injuries and two how do i enhance performance so the first stool is what's the best shoe for you for that sport. The second thing is orthotics, optimum alignment in those shoes. The third thing is strengthening of the feet and ankles, which is often ignored. You know, many athletes worry about how much they could bench press. They talk about how big their biceps are. Uh, but uh, many times when we have them balancing on one foot, uh, they leave a little bit to be desired. So uh, it's an educational process that I've been uh, barking about for, I don't know, about 35 years. <laughs> but why why do you think that they struggle with balance? Because some sports are... I wouldn't say better. struggling with balance. Yeah, I wouldn't say struggling with balance. Uh, but again, if you have uh, the terms pronation and supination are normal terms of the foot and ankle. In general, the pronated foot flattens out, becomes loose and flexible to absorb impact and shape to the ground. And in general, the supinated foot becomes like a spring lever to push you off. So when we have those kinds of 
complicated motions. And we're talking about running and jumping and changing direction. Uh, then many times we will see that again, the, the first shock absorbing mechanism of our body, our foundation are our feet and ankle. And also the most common injury in all of sports is ankle sprains and ankle injury. So we start paying big attention, the higher level, the more serious the sport is. Again, we start paying better uh, attention. And again, we might see that certain foot types, whether it's that over pronated flat type foot uh, has its own set of challenges. And so might the opposite or that high arch foot also cause different kinds of problems. Um, one of them, one of the common things we see in sports podiatry is called plantar fasciitis. It's a common problem in active people. They don't have to be athletes. And it's usually the arch of the feet and the heels hurting because of either activities or excessive strain. Uh, and uh, the older we get, the more some of these problems start really, really uh, being uh, notable. Uh, this is why, uh, again, when we go to the other end of the extreme youth sports, we really want to be paying attention to prevention, James, uh, regarding all sorts of uh, different uh, sporting activities. Uh, you know, you were an Olympian. Uh, these kids start very, very early with very serious uh, activities. There's a lot of overkill going on. And again, one of the reasons I wrote hashtag Hey Sports Parents with my co-author, Hall of Fame volleyballer, Sharky Zartman, uh, is um, I think you've been on Sharky's show. Haven't you been on Pep Talk with Sharky Zartman? Um, I don't think so, no. Not yet, not yeah, yet. Well, I, have, ha, I have to line you up. Uh, so we start paying a lot of attention. Uh, there is an epidemic of overuse youth sports injuries in the United States. Your country's no different, where everybody's pushing, everybody's uh, uh, trying to, in many instances, go way overboard with some of these boys and girls. And the idea, let alone the mental side, I'm sure it's no different. You talked about when you were on my show, The Sports Doctor, the kinds of pressures you put on yourself, the kinds of pressures uh, you might also uh, incorporate as a coach. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's as a life coach or an athletic coach. And, uh, uh, you know, the, there, are, there are many kids. One of the most infamous chapters in my book is called Youth, Sports, and Drugs, where we have young kids taking all sorts of over-the-counter pain medicines to try to stay in the game because everybody's got pressure on them. And this is where it starts, uh, uh, these, these kinds of... Um, uh, outlandish scheduled, and I have a young hockey player. She's 13 years old. Got a triple header this weekend. This wow. is nuts. When we're coming uh, and talking about uh, youth sports, and uh, we've just got to, um, uh, you know, really, really pay attention. And when we're talking the role of the foot, and we're talking about half the young girls I see in different sports. I'm seeing them because of knee problems, James, because of the song I sang to you, that the foot bone's connected to the ankle bone's connected to the knee bone. Uh, and, and the uh, big problem in all sports, which is these ACL, anterior crucial ligament tears in these young kids and serious athletes. So um, if you've got a mechanical imbalance, we would want to the best of our ability, pay attention to that, try to strengthen that, we recommend a lot of uh, physical therapy also to be able to show you or work with your son or daughter on what are the best exercises to try to stay away from overuse injury. Um, and it, we, we, we really, we push it a lot. But then also, Bob, you, you mentioned some of the problems you could have with your feet. What are some of the, the problems if you are to, are to incorporate, say, um, see if I can get this right now, inversion and eversion to that equation. Well, inversion, eversion, emotions. And if you have weakness 
over that range of motion, you're in trouble. One of the reasons I love rubber bands, again, I go back to my book, <clears throat> excuse me, hashtag a sports parents, because I have a chapter in there. It's called the two essential exercises. Doesn't mean they're the only ones. They're just essential. And one of them is rubber band strengthening of the feet and ankles. So when you use the word inversion, eversion, which is one of the motions normally of the foot and ankle, but there's also dorsiflexion, where your foot is moving up your toes to your nose, and there's plantar flexion, where you're pointing your toes. So strengthening those areas, rubber bands are great for that because they demand all sorts of control in motion. But the second essential exercise uh, is balance work where we're talking about balancing on tilt boards, mini trampolines, the BOSU, to strengthen at the very least as you go into, if you go into inversion and you have looseness or laxity of those areas, uh, you're going to get hurt or you're going to ag aggravate something. If you're strengthening that area proactively, that doesn't mean you can't get injured. It's just... Um, uh, uh, the best shot we have, uh, if we put somebody on a mini tram, James, mini trampoline, and we were to wire their whole body with sensors to show which muscles are working, and you stand on that mini tram or those unstable surfaces, I call it instability training, every muscle you own will light up because you're working all of those areas. So those are the two. I don't care if you're a runner. I don't care what your age is. I don't care if you're the best in the country or you're just looking to participate, including those exercises. I don't care how big your biceps are. Show me how strong your feet and ankles are. <laughs> and I think you raised a good point in terms of what we were talking about on your show in terms of um, ultimate mental perfectionism and, and things like that. I've recently... Big time. Done a, a questionnaire i think it's for wagner state university they sent a questionnaire out to my basketball team to i guess see what um people's answers are in terms of where they see themselves in terms of a a chain of uh, how they see themselves on a thing towards perfectionism so it was a, kind of an eye opener to me thinking well i was fortunate in a way that my parents weren't overbearing on, on my performance at a young age. You're thinking, well, yes, I could say why well, strong that doesn't mean with the argument. Yeah. That doesn't mean that our parents aren't. And again, there's so much good stuff around a lot of these things, you know, which when we're talking about the problems, uh, uh, but you know, parents who are supportive, I had a very famous, he's passed away years ago, sports psychology friend who shared the radio with me for a few years. And he was a colleague and I used to drag him along to all the Little League meetings with the parents when my son Adam played Little League. And I would talk about injuries. He would talk about the whole mental side of things. And he would talk to parents all the time about not being a critic, about being positive, about being a good listener, uh, the mental side of everything. You talked about that a lot. You've become a world-class athlete. You know what it takes in order to be able to pay that kind of attention, whether it's coming back from a problem or whether it's becoming a champion, the mental side is such a big deal. And uh, we talk about that a lot uh, in the book, Hashtag Hey Sports Parents. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you also, uh, which was about, uh, and have you as a guest talking about overcoming those kinds of challenges. And you mentioned your parents being very, very supportive and I, I agree with you. And they, again, they weren't critics. They weren't, you know, making things difficult. This is why so many children drop out because it's a drill. It's a job. Uh, and, and they're not interested in, in playing children's games with adult rules. So, you know, being a champion is not for everybody. Right, James? Right. I definitely agree with that, that, uh, <laughs> that message there, Bob. I think, I think, and I've spoken to my mom about this since she's come off her holiday recently, and she said there's only one time in my athletic career that she had to push me, and that would have been my senior year of high school 
where I was the team manager for the, the our soccer team, but I was also entered into a swimming competition locally, and I was kind of in a conundrum, so to speak, as to well, I wanted to go to the the soccer tournament with, with my high school, but then she, my mom did put me into into, into perspective. It's like, well, I was fortunate enough to be paid at the at the time as well for the swimming. She said, well, what do you get paid for to do? Okay, you've got a point. Good point. Good point. And again, you know, these are the things, of course, there are times uh, when parents have to be uh, uh, more, quote, unquote, instructive or a little bit less. You know, I, I have a chapter in the book. Actually, it's a section. It's called Parents' Perspectives. Maybe a half a dozen parents talking about the challenges and the highs and lows of parenting a child athlete. And there's all sorts of aspects uh, that go into that. You know, number one, you said it on my show, it's got to be fun for the kids. If it's not fun, then they're not going to stick with it. You know, and there's that overzealous parent many times that, you know, the the sideline uh, screamer and and, and ranter. uh, uh, You know, I have a a patient. uh, He's been a referee for 40 years, James, in high school and college basketball. And he's got some stories about parents and the whole aspect regarding, you know, a referee or an umpire uh, and these kinds of things. So uh, it's way, way out of line in in a lot of ways. And it's a very, very big business. There was a front cover story, James, on Time magazine in the United States, maybe a year ago. And on the front cover was a little eager. Uh, good looking. He probably was 10, 11 years old. And the caption was the $15 billion a year youth sports market. And uh, these kind, everything that goes into it, whether it's again, pressure, you know, when we watch the Olympics and we see like this past winter Olympics, the gold medalist in women's figure skating is the young Russian 15 and a half year old. Uh, then you know this kid must have been four, five, six, seven years old when she first started getting active. It's not um, uh, for everybody. Uh, and uh, therefore, you know, uh, uh, you can raise a glass uh, for your mom and dad that they did lots of stuff right with you. Um, but they also had to say to you, hey, man, you know, uh, if they're depending on you to be on the swimming team and this is what you or whatever we're paying for, then you got to show up. Right, James? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I think uh, when she said that to me this past week, it's like, well, I think now because I'm an adult myself and I'd have been 18, 19 at the time, it's like, well, she's she, she got a valid point. And by probably, like you said, instructing me to do this, she's coming from, from the right reasons. It's like, well, that's the sport I'm meant to be doing. It's only because I perceive soccer and being around my peers as more uh maybe more of a social inclusion aspect it's like well they're not gonna treat me any differently for not going to that competition as they would have done the rest of the season so I think I was just being how would I put it uh a normal teenager yeah that's understandable you know and there's the word you know some some kids could be a little lazy other kids, when I look at some of the schedules of some of these families, uh, my friend, and they have four kids, and 13-year-old boy, two 11-year-old twins, seven-year-old boy, all playing different sports, running around like crazy on a weekend, trying to make all these different schedules. This is really challenging, and there's a lot of uh, interesting questions, which is, again, it's not for everybody. got to be fun. The kids have to be interested. Uh, and, uh, you know, when Sharky, my co-author, Sharky Zartman, uh, the first six or seven chapters of the book where she writes uh, on the topic Sports Parenting 101, you know, she was a coach for years. She also became one of the best volleyball players in the country, member of the national team. So she lived it. And she talked about how important it is for parents understanding, you know, what level should this boy or girl be in? Uh, how uh, uh, important is the scheduling? You know, what about, you know, when we're complaining about uh, discomfort 
or uh, uh, injuries. I tell parents all the time, if your son or daughter needs over-the-counter pain medicine in order to play, you're over the line. You know, I'm in the United States, James. You guys don't have it in the uh, United Kingdom. We have TV advertising of medicines, prescription medicines, all day, 24-7. It never stops. And New Zealand is the only country, other country in the world that allows this. Uh, this constant barrage of uh, in the United States, you know, with the opioid crisis, mm. the pain pill crisis, and you say to yourself, where the hell does this start? Pardon my French. And many times it starts very early. You know, Dr. Weil, my daughter's got a ballet competition and her ankles are hurting her. So she's taking ibuprofen or she's taking aspirin and she needs it and she's living on it and these kinds of challenges. Uh, and this is something that we have to continue to educate uh, parents and coaches about, I just had two tremendous youth organizations on my show yesterday, the National Alliance of Youth Sports uh, since 1981, another one called Coach Tube, where again, they're talking about youth sports, communication with parents and coaches. We tell parents all the time, communicate with your coach. You know, there's a, the nightmare of coach abuse in youth sports. Uh, medical abuse. This is a nightmare in our country. And this is something that's very, very important that parents have to be aware of. Who is the coach of your son or daughter? And, uh, you know, I call them Svengali coaches, which is, you know, these dictators. And the more serious the sport, traveling sports, some of these other things, parents are spending a lot of money. There's a lot of pressure. Why do you mean your ankle still hurts? You know, this kind of stuff, James, is, is a big deal, uh, and, and we, we pay big attention to it uh, in the book. And, and I'd be interested to get your opinion on this, Bob, in terms of, uh, you, you know, with more and more kids becoming one-dimensional in, in terms of how they go into sport, whereas you go back probably 10, 15 years, they'd be more, more diverse in what they do. Do you think from a medical standpoint, that is more of a problem more so to this day because of they are fixated on yes in essence one we use the term um, we use we use the term specialization i have a great article on my uh, website sportsdoctorradio.com if you go to newspaper articles we would love all boys and girls to grow up playing multiple sports and use different parts of the body uh, but we used a little bit before the example of figure skating. I have a chapter in the book. It's called the prodigy sports. Again, think of gymnastics, think of ballet, figure skating, even tennis and soccer, where you have 10, 11, 12 year olds. This is all they want to play. You could tell them all day. Uh, so with these boys and girls who specialize, we tell the parents, number one, you've got to have recovery time and time off. Uh, number two, you've got to get under the tutelage of a good physical therapist who could show your son or daughter and you what are the best exercises to try to stay out of trouble. And uh, there are, again, those sports where this is what these kids want to do. And medically, it is an advantage to play other sports, James. Absolutely. And that's great. Unless your son or daughter says, Ma, I don't want to play other sports. I want to be a dancer, and this is what I want to do, and I'm going to want to do it 10 days a week. And these, these specializations are a challenge, and we definitely have, and we actually have a condition, James, uh, named after that. It's called repetitive motion injuries. Think of that little eager with the arm problems. You know, in the United States, they're doing Tommy John elbow surgery on teenagers because of overkill, because of the same motions. So again, I, I dedicate a chapter to that, which is basically talking about, uh, you've got to make sure of recovery time, regardless of the sport. Uh, when you're doing the same thing all the time as you grow, there is a higher injury rate. Some of the best athletes in the world played lots of different sports, but it's a tough sell. The United States women's gold medalist, uh, World Gold Cup champion soccer women, 80% of them, James, played other sports growing up. 
So we would like kids to play a lot of sports and start to specialize maybe 15, 16 years old, something like that. But this is a tough sell for my figure skaters. I, I you know, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a challenge. But is it a cultural thing that's it kind of shifted that way? Or is it because, um, say, the likes of American football, you, can't, you have to get in it, I won't say as soon as possible, but once you're playing contact, uh, it's becoming more, you have yeah. to specialize. It's both. It's number one, it's a myth. There is no evidence that shows that playing only one sport gives you an advantage. But again, with the $15 billion a year youth sports injury everywhere, where you've got specialty coaches and specialty schools, and you have this pressure of a coach saying to you, you know, James, you're 11, 12, 13 years old, you start playing other sports, you're going to fall behind with the swimmers. So we want you to really be specializing in the one sport. And this is a sell job. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it is one of these things where you can't get kids to play other sports if they don't want to play them. So it gets back to that individual conversation and discussion uh, in order to be able to try to be the best you could be but specialization is a problem, and many times these repetitive motion injuries, uh, again, you're figure skating six days a week, you're jumping 200 times a week, <laughs> you know, that body is really uh, going to be, uh, you know, facing some challenges. So uh, if, if you can mix in some other sports, absolutely making sure one of the biggest challenges today continues to be you must allow recovery time, regardless of your level. Uh, and, and this is a, a, a real challenge. It, it, the higher the level, the more the, the impression, the mindset is, I've got to be training year-round. I've got to be playing year-round. And uh, so uh, the education continues to be a challenge, letting everybody know that overkill times 10 is one of our biggest uh, challenges. And my penultimate question to you, Bob, um, what was the initial idea about writing Hey, pa hey Sports Parents as a book? I've been around these kids for decades. Again, uh, whether it be figure skating or tennis and some of these other sports. And uh, I, I've always been interested by the challenge professionally of dealing with these kids. And on my radio show, I've had so many different experts again, in all of these different areas, nutrition, physical training, the mental end, et cetera, uh, that I really, uh, uh, and when I found somebody like Sharky Zartman who had written books and who knew what it took to put it together, we have like this 21 great cartoons in the book about a lot of these topics. When I was able to couple with somebody who really knew what they were doing, uh, then the, the, uh, uh, we got it done. Very, very proud of it. Uh, it's an easy read. It's an entertaining read, but it's also very informative. Uh, but it, it's been an area of interest for me. I've been talking about it truly for 25 years, uh, these kinds of challenges with youth sports. So I, I finally got the opportunity to make it happen. And my it's available on Amazon, too, by the way. And my final question to you, Bob, before we wrap up the episode is if you had to summarize what we've been speaking about today into one sentence for people to take away, what would that be? The role of the foot in activities and especially in sports is something you really want to pay attention to. I think that's a great one to end on. So once again, Bob, thanks again for coming on the Mindset Game podcast. Hey, my pleasure, James. Good luck to you and all the great things you're doing. And uh, we will reconnect. Thank you very much. Oh, it's been my pleasure. And before I forget, I would really appreciate it if you would be so kind as to leave a short written review as it helps to get the podcast more notoriety and it will be more visible in future to others and thus helping more people, which my guests and I are all about. 
Once again, thanks for listening, and I'll catch you next time for another episode of the Mindset Game Podcast. Oh, my God.